Okay, good evening, everybody. I am Reinhard Reitmeier, and I have the uh, honor of being the uh, outgoing RCI Science Chair. So I'd like to welcome everybody to this um, conversation we're going to have and demonstration on uh, in a pickle fermented foods. You might guess from my name that I have uh, German roots. In fact, I was born in Germany in Bavaria. And I was reflecting on my uh, sauerkraut diet, very common in my mother's cooking. And then I realized that almost every culture has some, si some sort of fermented food. And it's really about preserving things over the winter months, especially in the northern climates. And you can think of sauerkraut or kimchi, etc., cetera, um, pickles, just the list goes on and on. It's really interesting. So a little bit about uh, folks who don't know what RCI science. So um, our mission is a very simple one. That is to bring science to the public. And we've been doing that since 1849. So you heard that right. So RCI science is older than our country Canada and uh, we've had uh, to make like a lot of people you know, call it a pivot because of the COVID-19 pandemic normally we'd be gathering uh, in various places like at the U of T campus in Ottawa Mississauga we've had events out at east and west etc but now we're going you know of course virtual like a lot of organizations are so again, we're all learning how to do this, and there might be a few hiccups even tonight about trying to connect with everybody and make sure microphones and videos are working. So please bear with us as we work through through this new technology for a lot of us. Um, I have a announcement, and you'll be the kind of first to know about this. Since um, 1982, RCI Science has awarded the Sanford Fleming Metal and Samford Fleming was our our founder, um, and this medal goes to an individual working in Canada who's made an outstanding contribution to science communication, which I indicated already was our our mission. And we're delighted to announce tonight that the 2020 winner of the Fleming Medal is. Professor Timothy Caulfield from the University of Alberta. Now, the official announcement will come out tomorrow morning, and you'll get further details on the interesting work Timothy Caulfield is doing in terms of communicating science to the public via books, you know, videos, now even on streaming services on television, where he himself is basically a human subject. It's a very interesting series if you want to tune into that. So I want to thank everybody for tuning in to our annual kickoff event. And it's actually um, Science Literacy Week. And it's a national celebration of science. And I'd like to thank uh, NSERC. It's the National Science and Engineering Research Council. It's a federal funding agency that gives out grants to researchers in the sciences, but also has very, been very, very active in funding science communication. And we've been very, very fortunate to receive a number of grants from NSERC, and we really would like to thank them for providing that funding to allow us to engage with the public. Um, really important initiative. Um, like a lot of people, normally, you know, we would be gathering in person to have a kickoff event. Um, and of course, this year, uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we're not able to do so. Again, you know, health and safety of all our members and Canadians is top of mind for everyone. Um, so we again, as I said, pivoted to this remote or online version. And uh, I think it'll be an Nevertheless, a very informative, as usual, 
but I also hope it's going to be entertaining and fun. I'm a scientist myself, and I think if science isn't fun, if science is hard, but if science isn't fun, you shouldn't be doing it. So um, it's my really great pleasure to uh, hand over to uh, our incoming chair, uh, Dr. Suzanne McDonald, uh, who is uh, a really outstanding scientist. Got to know her over the last couple of years and all the great work she does. Uh, she's at, uh, her daytime job is at uh, New York University. So again, over to you, Suzanne. Again, thank you to everybody for uh, connecting with us this evening. Enjoy. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Reinhard, and thanks for being such a great chair. This is weird that you're handing it over. And thanks, everybody, for joining us. We really appreciate it. We may have some hiccups. Things may go wrong. It doesn't matter. It's fermentation. I'm ridiculously excited about this. Last September, last September, I was peer pressured into going to the Ontario Fermentation Festival, which I thought, oh, yawn, this will be terrible. It turned out it was amazing. And I began my love affair with sourdough at that time. And now we're going to have cabbage. <laughs> I couldn't be more happy. So we're hopefully going to have a great evening. We're going to learn about the science of fermentation and then we're hopefully going to have a demo on how to make sauerkraut. So let's hope that all works. This is, again, as Reinhardt said, normally we'd be in person, we are not. Um, but we wanna hear from you as we go along. So we're gonna have a Q&A session. You can submit your questions or your comments, whatever you've got in the chat box or via Twitter, so at RCI Science, or you can email us at information at rciscience.ca. So um, this is, remember to be polite and respectful, you know, with your questions. We are monitoring the chat box. So if you're not, we're going to cut you off. So uh, without further ado, let me introduce our speaker for the evening, our first speaker for the evening, uh, Dr. Amy Pru. Uh, and I think she's going to come on. I am. There we are. Hi, Suzanne. <laughs> Fabulous. So Amy is a professor and academic program coordinator for culinary innovation and food technology at Niagara College. That's got to be like the best title ever. Um, she found have a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. I mean, culinary innovation and food technology. So uh, Amy founded the Canadian Food and Wine Institute Innovation Center at Niagara College back in 2012. Um, the Innovation Center is to support food manufacturing companies to access high quality science in ways that will increase their capacity to innovate and grow. This is exactly what RCI Science is all about, is bringing science to everyone. Amy is currently the president-elect for the Canadian Institute of Food Science and Technology, and she sits on the National Board of Directors for Food Processing Skills Canada. She's kind of a big deal. Uh, <laughs> Capacity <laughs> building in food science is dominating her current research, which is focused on food science educator development, understanding the transition between science education and industrial development, and innovation practice for small business. Take it away, Amy. Awesome. I am so honored to be here for the kickoff event and was really delighted to receive the invitation from Reinhardt and Suzanne and the team behind the science event. Um, honestly, the theme of biodiversity is this year's NSERC theme for its uh, Science Literacy Week. And honestly, fermentation is such an exciting theme to think about because the biodiversity of fermentation is really quite profound. Uh, Reinhardt mentioned that fermentation is so common in northern climates, but equally too, many of the fermentations that are so common in our diet are actually from equatorial regions because preservation under the warm, um, high temperature environment meant that uh, pre-industrialization, there needed to be really high quality means of extending the shelf life of all that wonderful product that people were uh, creating. So. Give me a second here. I'm going to switch over to my slideshow. I'm got to figure out how to share my screen here. So I'm going to click share screen. Entire screen share and pardon me. I I'm going to jump in here. But uh, 
Again, I, I am really, really fortunate to be at Niagara College and was able to join in a really entrepreneurial mindset. Um, back in 2012, I helped found the NSERC funded um, Innovation Centre. And uh, since then, my role has evolved a lot. And now I really focus a lot more of my work on um, entrepreneurship and innovator development and do a lot of work in education. I always like to give gratitude to a lot of the uh, food science um, inspirations that came before me. I was really extremely fortunate in my career to have the chance to have courses with Dr. Norm Borlaug when I did my PhD at Iowa State University. And he was very inspirational in, in terms of how I teach. He, he would come into the classroom and um, insist that we not only be extremely good scientists, but we also be extremely good uh, communicators and go out and advocate for the communities that we're trying to serve. And just to uh, read out his quote, I want to see science serve a useful purpose to improve the standard of living for all people. You can't build a peaceful world on empty stomachs and human misery. And honestly, um, that aspect of advocacy behind the science that we do is so resonant in the way that I work with uh, small, small businesses and the way I work with my students. I am really lucky to be at Niagara College and food and wine is what we do all day long. Um, honestly, we have an amazing team of food scientists, of culinary specialists, and we get to think about food all day. <laughs> and it's, it's a pretty cool scenario that we spend our day working on increasing the science literacy both of students as well as the um, different stakeholders that come through our door. Um, so many of them are small businesses and they reach out to us and say, how do we do our food processing better? How do we apply good science in a useful way? And so teaching is really, really important. I love fermentation. Honestly, um, it was a ton of fun. And later on, I'll introduce you to my show and tell collection of some of the different fermentation products that we have out there. But so many of the different food products that we're eating on a daily basis are fermented foods. Um, you likely started your breakfast this morning with a bunch of fermented foods that uh, could include a piece of toast. That bread is a fermented food. Maybe you had some different pickles or sauces on a sandwich for your lunch. Maybe you had some yogurt with your lunch. These are all fermented foods as well. And um, then there's even foods that we don't think about that are fermented. Many of the ingredients that we're including in the processed foods that we have are fermented foods. If you had, uh, maybe you had a soda pop and it had citric acid in it. That citric acid was a product of industrial fermentation. Almost every food that we are eating in some shape or form has fermentation behind it. So it's it's a pretty exciting field to research and it's, it's something that is also really accessible to people at home Home, that fermentation isn't just something that goes on in big, huge factories. You can you can set this up in your own home kitchen. And it's such a wonderful way to access science with kids and teenagers so that they can get a sense that, yeah, science is accessible. Science is fun. Science you can eat. And that's the best feeling of all, that when you can do an experiment and then you can eat the results at the end. That's really, really cool. Now, I promised that I would have lots of science content. And so let's take a look at one of our favorite pathways. And this is the glycolytic pathway. We've got glucose and we are, oh, at step number one, we are taking ADP and we are producing ATP. For those of you who took high school science and you did that Krebs cycle, you know that ATP is the powerhouse that runs cells. We need ATP and every cell is using it in a way that it's using for all sorts of different uh, metabolic pathways. ATP is the batteries that make life happen. So in the most basic type of fermentation, we are seeing glucose broken up so that we are recharging those ATP batteries. And in the meantime, we are producing pyruvate. And as part of that, we are producing carbon dioxide. Oh, carbon dioxide, this could be fun. And we also get out there acetaldehyde, which is converted to ethanol when we're doing the recharge of the NAD or nicotine adenine dinucleotide. So 
We are producing ethanol. We are producing CO2, carbon dioxide from glucose. That's the most basic of fermentation pathways. And honestly, it's perhaps the most fun of fermentation pathways. I can't see the chat box, but I'm going to bet you uh, lots of you already know what the fun is. It's, uh, and so cheers to you if you got it. Um, honestly, that is the pathway that is one of our most fun fermentations. It is how we are creating the alcohol that we enjoy as wine, as beer, as distilled spirits. We harness that fermentation for uh, much of what's going on. It's also the same fermentation that's going on in bread. And so while you're thinking about it, in the case of bread, we're not capitalizing against the ethanol. We're actually capitalizing against the CO2. The carbon dioxide is what is inflating the bread and giving it the nice lofty uh, sponge-like texture that is occurring in that fermentation. So that's one of our most basic fermentations. And it's likely one of the most common ones that are out there. Um, here's some Saccharomyces yeast. And this is a scanning electron microscope. Again, if, if any of you want to find out where the references are for this, uh, just reach out to the wonderful folks at um, the Society, and I would be glad to connect with you directly. So Saccharomyces yeast are wonderful, wonderful little tiny factories, if I can uh, use that term. They are very small, but at the same time, too, you, you can often see them in quantity large enough um, so many of the different uh, microorganisms that we think of in food are in, in uh, quantities that are invisible. But in the case of Saccharomyces yeast, we are using it in very, very large quantity, just in, in such, they are microscopically small. It's, it's really cool. You can see the budding scars on these yeasts. They grow out almost like a balloon where they balloon out to the side and then that splits off. That's how the, the yeast are multiplying. And you can see these bud scars on the yeast. Oh, we get even better. <laughs> the thing is we see that singular um, fermentation pathway. There are so many more diverse fermentation pathways. This happens to be the Loy pathway. And it was an Argentinian scientist uh, who received the Nobel prize for discovering this pathway um, many years ago, I believe it was 1970. And this is the um, emden meyerhoff uh, pathway. And we also have the hexose monophosphate shunt. These are also important fermentation pathways that are occurring in, and then in this case, this is the pathway that lactose is fermented in dairy products. So if you had some cheese with your sandwich at lunchtime, you are taking advantage of this lactose fermentation pathway because lactose from milk is going to be first split into galactose and glucose. So lactose is a, is a disaccharide sugar. It's got two pieces to it. So we've first got to split it into galactose and glucose. And then those are shunted into two different pathways. The galactose is fermented most commonly in what's called a homofermentative uh, pathway. And that's where we're producing um, we're producing lactate salts from that, but you can also have heterofermentative pathways where you are producing lactic, or lactic acid as well, but also ethanol and acetate, acetate being the um, organic acid behind vinegar. And so it's, it's nice to think of in, in very reductive forms. Food scientists often make a joke saying, we are the scientists that deal with the wonderful, messy, and horrible soup of all cells dying. And we have to extend that life of, of the cells dying in long, long progressions as much as possible. We are capturing the, uh, the, the life and all the enzymatic activity of the living cells, and we're converting it into an art form where we're taking advantage of all of these different biochemical pathways and adjusting all of the different parameters within time, temperature, salt conditions, and so on to be able to achieve an art, to be quite frank. We want to have good lactic acid formation in our cheese, or maybe we want to have propionic acid or acetate occurring. We're, we're, we're leveraging all these different pathways in ways that are going to create the foods that we want. Here's another scanning electron microscope diagram of uh, some lactobacillus. And I always joke with my students that uh, the students that come from countries where Latin languages are spoken, French, Spanish, um, Italian, 
they have an advantage. Lactobacillus uh, comes from milk and bacillus is the Latin word for stick. So sticks in your milk. And you can see that lovely rod shape that is um, where the naming is coming from. And it, I always, always laugh saying, you come to my chemistry class, you're gonna speak Latin at the end. But uh, so many of the different organisms that we uh, have created names for, those names are coming from the Latin. And that's long history of science being communicated in Latin. I loved finding this scanning electron microscope um, image because this is a SEM of cabbage. And we will be we will be taking a look at cabbage. The the scientist who uh, would have taken this image decided to color each of the different species organisms in a slightly different color, and so oftentimes when we're thinking of fermentation and 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 I know there's biochemists and and Reinhardt is a biochemist by trade. Honestly, we think in very discrete systems. When we're talking about food, we're talking about a wonderful biodiverse system. And in the case of fermenting cabbage, you can have a whole wide variety of different um, lactobacillus, you can have different yeasts, and we take advantage of that immense biodiversity when approaching the fermentation that we're going to be accomplishing. Now, in the case of Saccharomyces, we talked about Saccharomyces. Again, that's the yeast that is most common in um, uh, alcoholic fermentations and in bread fermentations. And it's really quite neat to think about the ecosystems that are existing around Saccharomyces yeast. Oftentimes, Saccharomyces yeast is introduced into food systems by social insects, uh, flies, bees, wasps, etc., dropping the yeast onto that product. And those yeasts, again, are often living in a community with other different organisms that are going to be either promoting its growth or reducing its growth. So for example, we've got lactic acid bacteria and acetic acid bacteria down here. The exometabolites of these organisms, so as you can guess lactobacillus or lactic acid bacteria, these are organisms that their primary exometabolite is going to be lactic acid on fermentation of, of simple sugars. That production of lactic acid acts as an inhibition to Saccharomyces yeast. Same with Acetobacter or Gluconobacter. These are bacteria that are, as you can guess, Acetobacter. It's going to be creating acetic acid, which is vinegar. These are bacteria that through the production of acetate are going to have an inhibiting factor on the growth of Saccharomyces. And so we have to really think in very, uh, very deliberate ecosystems when thinking about food fermentations. Now, again, I mentioned at the very beginning, the most simple of fermentation cycles is that uh, a glycolytic pathway, but there are so many other um, biosynthetic pathways that are going on in the different organisms. This is a diagram that's showing some of the different esters that are occurring during yeast fermentation. And there, there's some really great science behind uh, looking at yeast and finding different um, different uh, species of yeast that produce esters that give um, really delightful um, flavor profiles to some of the alcoholic beverages that we're uh, enjoying. And there's some really great scientists, George Vandermeer at uh, the University of Guelph is one of them. I've got some friends like Nate Ferguson at Escarpment Labs, and they are yeast they're yeast farmers. They actually use that term and they joke about it. But what they do is they go and they harvest Saccharomyces and other um, complementary yeasts such as Britannomyces. And they, they isolate those yeasts to look for very specific ester production. And they're looking for amplified ester production that is going to accentuate wonderful flavor profiles in alcoholic beverages. And I think that's a pretty awesome job to have to be a yeast farmer and think of, I get to create esters from that. But honestly, um, there's, a, there's a really interesting advantage to this too. If you are in the food manufacturing sector, right now so many consumers want to have natural flavors. And rather than having synthetic or uh, artificial flavors, as you'd read it on an ingredient declaration, these, um, uh, they're exactly identical to the naturally occurring esters from uh, fruits and vegetables, but 
from a labeling perspective, they can be labeled as a natural flavoring agent. And so there's a there's not just uh, within the alcohol community, there's a lot of interest to be harvesting yeast and their fermentation powers for um, creation of fine chemicals of all sorts of different types. Another thing that's really cool about fermentation, we talked, uh, uh, Reinhardt mentioned that fermentation of fruits and vegetables is common in northern climates, but again, it's also quite common across the world. I brought up this slide because, to be honest, this is what I spent a lot of my time in my PhD studies on. Um, I had the chance to work on foods made out of corn or maize. And one aspect of fermentation is that it does increase the nutritional quality of a lot of different products. On fermentation, you are often degrading not just the uh, sugar or carbohydrate component. In many cases, during fermentation, you are also degrading proteins or other um, biological components within the food product. And I brought this slide up because in the case of many grain products, fermentation acts as a enhancer of nutrition by breaking down phytic acid. And so um, phytic acid happens to be, uh, for those of you who are chemists here, you can see all these wonderful uh, phosphate groups have negative charges and they're, if phyt phytate binds up um, divalent cations within the diet. So iron, zinc, copper, they're tightly bound to phytic acid and they're excreted out in the feces rather than absorbed. And so by breaking down phytic acid during lactic acid fermentation, you're going to be increasing the bioavailability of the divalent uh, cations within the diets, especially iron and zinc. So fermentation is extremely powerful when it comes to being able to improve global nutrition. And there's a huge history of fermented food products in much of Sub-Saharan Africa is again, fermentation, and I'll talk about this in a slide in a moment, has a, a protective effect. We mentioned how the exometabolites of many of the uh, beneficial fermentation organisms act as inhibitory factors on some of the other spoilage organisms that could be reducing the shelf life of these food products. Oh, this one's fun. I, uh, before I went to Niagara College, I used to work for the Canadian Food Inspection Agency in meat processing programs. And oftentimes we don't think about the fact that we're not just fermenting fruits and vegetables. In many cases, we're fermenting meat or fish. And there's some really famous uh, fermented animal products. Um, Surastroming is one of them. It's a, uh, it's a fish, um, canned fish product that's um, almost eaten like a dare because it's so potently smelly. Um, salami, um, prosciutto, these are all fermented meat products as well. And honestly, uh, we've got a wide variety of different yeast molds and um, we're taking advantage of the fact that we're not just breaking down the glycogen within that meat. The glycogen would be the stored carbohydrate energy source that uh, skeletal muscle would be using for um, ATP generation. We store it as glycogen and, and, and break it down into glucose, which is then used for glycolysis. But um, during that fermentation, the glycogen is broken down and slowly turned into lactic acid. But we also, from the various organisms in that fermentation, see proteolysis and lipolysis. And that's where we're getting a lot of the free amino acids that create that great umami flavor that we get in good quality um, fermented meat. And we get some of the free fatty acids and lipolytic products that have really nice flavor profile. I brought this slide up and I, I regret I didn't have my camera uh, last week, uh, but we also ferment things like soybeans. Tempeh is becoming more and more popular. And I noted that Maple Leaf Foods now has a tempeh product that they are selling under their Lifeline label. Fermenting, again, is such a really neat way of increasing the nutritional quality of food products. And it is a really amazing way of introducing so much cultural diversity. Tempeh is originally from the Indonesian region and they would have taken a wide variety of different grains and soaked them and the natural flora the rhizopus oligosporus uh, mold organism in this case it's a it's a mold based fermentation that we're seeing the rhizopus oligosporus organism that's commonly found on banana leaves 
rapidly inoculates that grain as it's being stored. And again, we're seeing really good reduction of phytic acid and a bit of proteolysis to improve the nutritional quality of those grains as compared to just eating them as a boiled grain. This is a uh, tempeh that we made in class. I love doing fermentation work with my students and um, introducing them into some of these products is, is really cool. I brought up this slide too, besides the fact that I ride my bicycle past this plant every weekend. Um, fermentation is not just something that's done at the household level, it's an incredibly important industrial process. This is young bun flower and it's in down in Port Colborne, Ontario. And young bun flower is one of the world's largest producer of uh, citric acid. So what are they doing? They're bringing in corn, that's the well and canal on the, on the left side of the photo. They're bringing in ships of corn and converting that corn, the starch within that corn, as you know, starch is just long branch chain of glucose. They're breaking that down and using the, the uh, potential of Aspergillus niger, which is a, a fungal organism and capitalizing on its capability to produce citric acid. Is trying to learn more about science that they say well that's all synthetic and like chemicals are everywhere chemicals it, it's really quite cool to think about now so many people are enjoying fermented foods because there's a potentially um, beneficial aspect to the gut microbiota in nutrition and um, increasing the biodiversity of the organisms within our gut is part of it and you'll see all sorts of different potential uh, diseases that are caused by minimized biodiversity within the gut and a lot of potential positives from consuming. This came from a really great review in the British Medical Journal uh, back in 2018. Um, again, one reason for uh, having a biodiverse microflora within the human gut is that there's all sorts of different potential ways that the organisms that are fermenting away inside your gut, we have about two kilos of bacteria and, uh, and uh, fungus within our gut at any period of time. They're fermenting away based off of the different prebiotic components that are within our diet, soluble fibers and so on. Many of the different organic acids that are being produced during that process have and net health benefits and many of the short chain fatty acids and lipolytic products are also being investigated um, quite actively by the scientific community to identify if there's uh, potential health benefits from this. Part of that fermentation too though is that we know that based off of uh, poor management you may end up with a bit of gas. Hey back to that original fermentation cycle CO2 is part of fermentation. Now, what is really interesting, we've got all of these potential health claims that are being investigated, but Health Canada right now, it's really challenging for the food industry because it's hard to make strange specific claims. And I looked in the guide to food labeling for industry, and right now you cannot make any strange specific claims for food products. So you can't be out there saying lactobacillus improves your digestion. It's just not allowed by Health Canada at this point. And this is something that the scientific community can go out and do more advocacy on. Right now, there are non-strain specific claims. And I pulled this also from the Guide for Food Labeling for Industry. This is the regulatory Bible or holy book, if you want to um, be inclusive. It is the regulatory book that every food manufacturer has to work against in Canada. And right now, the really the only thing you can say about um, having fermented foods is that probiotics naturally form part of the gut flora or is it's or it contributes to healthy gut flora. Honestly, the, the claims that you can make are pretty lackluster. And so the, the, the burden for food companies is that they also have to have shelf life studies and they have to go through a major document submission. And then after they've gone through that submission, other companies can take advantage of 
the submission that's done by one company. Companies in Canada are a little bit uh, shy to use probiotic claims because there was also a major class action lawsuit in 2010 with Group Danone and their Dan Active yogurt. And it was a multi-million dollar class action lawsuit that was lost by the food company relative to their probiotic claims. I always tell my students who are studying science, look at the surrounding politics and the regulatory environment that you're working in, because that's going to be just as important. Now, one of the big challenges in fermentation is that retailers want to see products sit on a shelf. And honestly, in general, for uh, most pickle products, they want an 18 month to two year shelf life. And so oftentimes we have to work with food processors and find what are called log reduction times. Organisms within that food product based off of time and temperature combinations, we can kill them off and use statistical process control. And I know that sounds, sounds horrible after we've gone to all that effort, but this is the balancing act that we as food scientists have to, have to face. In many cases, we are able to set up a fermentation and create stability because we have created the competitive inhibition where the metabolites that uh, that are supporting the fermentation are, are used up and the exometabolites, all those wonderful organic acids act as inhibitors. But in, uh, in other cases, the retailers say, we don't want to put up with the risk, we want you to pasteurize it. And the, I spend a lot of time helping companies with these pasteurization cycles because it's a little bit tricky, but I, I noted some of my students were in the chat box. Hi, students. Um, they get to learn how to do all of this uh, process methodology and help companies with that time temperature. There's a lot of different tools um, that scientists use for fermentation, water activity, uh, titratable acidity. Some of these tools just happen to be things that are quite affordable. Um, uh, the, this is a hydrometer and it's used for measuring the brine concentration of salt. And you can pick those up for about $10 online. And this is a refractometer. Some of the different fermentations, you want to be able to track the, ref, uh, the bricks value or the soluble solids content. And these are quite affordable tools that help bring science into the home. You can find these on Amazon for pretty cheap, uh, $20, $30. Water activity meter, that's a couple thousand dollars. Just to round out my talk here, I did want to put my top picks and I believe the I believe the folks are going to post this in the chat box, but I chose a couple books. Some of them are more focused on uh, recipes that you can do at home, but they're written really well with a really good science basis. Sandra Ellick's Cats, Wild Fermentation is one of my favorite. David Zilber, who's a Toronto-based chef, worked with Rene Redzepi on the Noma Guide to Fermentation. I also put in there um, Health Canada's official methods for microbiological analysis of foods. I, I can't stress this enough. Health Canada and many of the regulatory agencies in Canada share their scientific protocols. And all you have to do is reach out to them and ask and say, hey, can I see all of the microbiology protocols used by food companies in Canada? And they'll send you a zip file. And just starting to read about science, even though much of it may be, if you're, if you're new to science or you're a student, it may be over your head. I really like how wonderful the science community is in Canada. And people reach out by email or through LinkedIn. And, and if you ask really good questions, it's very, very rare that people won't answer you. Start reading, ask good questions. I also put in uh, FAO's Fermented Fruits and Vegetables, a global perspective. And last but not least, to round it out, uh, Dr. Wendy Keenley's side at the University of Guelph has an open access textbook on microbiology. And I just, I just uh, really encourage people to just start reading and asking questions. And there's so many wonderful scientists in Canada who just love science communication, reach out to them. And if you have a really good question, I bet they'll answer. Just wanted to round out my talk with some of my students and I love my students and we have so much fun working with all sorts of different foods and fermentations and food science is awesome. I highly, highly recommend investigating more about food science. We, we get to eat our experiments. So we'll leave it at that. Perfect. Thank you so much, Amy. I just love that idea of science you can eat. I mean, what could be better? Science and eating. The two best things ever. Also, I had no idea. I now want to be a yeast farmer. That sounds awesome. <laughs> I want to do that. That's great. And hi to Amy's students if you're listening. That's terrific. So we're going to have time for questions later, but I, we're going to move on to the next part of our event. And I'm going to introduce you to Rebecca Hutton, who is a pickle maker and owner of Alchemy Pickle Company. 
and she has over 15 years of experience in the hospitality industry and extensive experience in tourism, nonprofit, and environmental sectors. She has so much knowledge about sustainable, healthy food and help to, we, you know, is part of the growth grow good food movement that I think is all taking over the whole country, especially during the pandemic. So she's built a food business that draws people who want to learn more about what they put onto their plate and into their bodies, really. If you want to learn more about the Alchemy Pickle Company, you can visit their websites, alchemy, alchemypicklecompany.ca. That's pretty easy. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Rebecca, and we're going to have a demo. And if the sound doesn't work, then we'll deal with that. But we're going to hope that it's all going to work. Take it away. Okay, great. Hello. Um, thanks so much for having me. This is uh, really an excellent evening. I'm excited to have the, uh, the science nerd uh, um, explaining um, the things that we do every day. So um, today we're gonna make a sauerkraut, but I just wanna talk a little bit about um, what fermentation is from um, a non-science uh, uh, person. So um, fermenting um, foods use for us, uh, for our purposes, we're using salt to inhibit bad bacteria and create a good environment for um, the good bacteria. So the um, probiotics that are um, going into the food preserve the ferment and they provide that um, sour um, taste that you're familiar with in your sauerkraut or your sour pickle. Um, they um, encourage um, the, uh, sorry, they make the nutrition more bioavailable to you, as Amy is talking about with the, um, talking about the fermentation of corn, um, so that uh, um, your body is able to digest more of the nutrients, um, and you get um, also many layers of flavor from those, um, from those probiotics, from the fermentation. Um, okay, so I started Alchemy uh, nine years ago. Um, we ferment uh, local organic produce in Toronto. Uh, we saw farmers markets and um, retailers all throughout southern Ontario. Uh, we make about 30 different products, um, but sauerkraut is our mainstay. Um, we've got a couple of photos of our, that's our kombucha. Um, I saw the next slide was maybe uh, a cabbage patch, perhaps. This was just on Monday. We took our team out to Sosnicki's Organic Farm. This is where we get most of our cabbages from. So we got to actually be right in the patch where the cabbages are coming from, uh, which is super fun. Um, I don't know if there's more photos for us to look at. Um, this is a classic sour dill cucumber pickles, always very popular. Uh, limited supply. It's, it's challenging to get certified organic vegetables that are kind of ideal for what we're doing in Ontario. So we cherish every pickle we make. Um, there's the cabbage. We're going to be doing that in just a few minutes. And that's our torpedo. That's a carrot, onion, and cabbage sauerkraut. Um, I've got something kind of similar we're going to look at in a second. Uh, that's the kimchi in jars. So we make a regional kimchi using all local produce. And yeah, that's that. Um, so uh, why do we want to have fermented vegetables? Um, so we're building up layers of flavor. Um, essentially, uh, we're adding salt to the cabbage. We're going to do that. Um, then layers or communities of bacteria are going to come in and make the uh, lower the pH and make the um, uh, the sour flavors. So as the acidity goes down, we're having new communities of bacteria coming in. And so when it finally reaches its final pH, which is about um, you could say about three, um, that's going to provide the natural preservation and um, all the flavors uh, in there. So then we need to refrigerate it. We're not heating anything. We're not pasteurizing. Um, it, it, it is challenging as a food business because the retailers, as Amy mentioned, uh, do want a longer shelf life. Uh, but um, there's also, you know, we also need to compromise. We want 
all of the health benefits. So, um, so nothing is pasteurized here. We're not using any vinegar. Um, and uh, I feel like the vinegar versus fermentation um, question is something that comes up a lot. Um, most people um, just get your Bix pickle in the supermarket, but the vinegar pickle is heated and then it's shelf stable. Whereas fermented products are using salt and maybe water in a salt brine, and then um, they're fermented at room temperature or slightly cooler depending on where you live. Um, and uh, and then they're stored in the fridge until you're ready to eat them. So it's not um, preserving it forever. It's preserving it for flavor and taste in your harvest season. Um, so the components that we are always looking at are salt. Um, so I recommend using just an unrefined sea salt. Um, nothing like a table salt. You don't want any additives in your salt. I like a coarse salt, so something that hasn't been processed very much. Um, then we have water. In some cases, your dill pickles would have water and salt brine. Um, for the sauerkraut, we're not going to add water. All of everything you need for the sauerkraut is already um, on the outside or within the cabbage. Um, and then we're looking at temperature. So uh, the um, microbes that we're um, creating an environment for them uh, to live in uh, love um, like about 18 degrees. Um, we have a fermentation phase that's between 18 and 20 degrees. You can ferment at higher or lower temperatures. It's going to change the, um, the flavor profile and possibly the texture of your sauerkraut. Um, other variables are your vegetables. So if you're using a vegetable that is firm, that's harvested in cooler weather, it's going to store a lot longer than a vegetable that's harvested in um, in the summer, like a cucumber, it's going to be softer. It's not going to store as long. Um, it also depends on how you're cutting, um, how you're cutting up your vegetables. Uh, smaller cuts are going to ferment faster. Uh, larger cuts are going to ferment slower. You're going to have a texture change. So um, we put some of those um, suggestions in the comments. Um, if you are thinking about how to cut up your sauerkraut. Um, we use a much thicker cut, the four millimeter cut for the sauerkraut here so that um, it stays crunchy for a longer period of time. It's also just a personal preference. You may want um, different uh, slices for different times of the year or different vegetables. Um, and then time. So you're balancing the amount of salt the type of vegetable, um, the temperature you're fermenting at, and then how long you're fermenting at. Um, so uh, it really depends on your environment. Uh, if it's warmer, you have a shorter time. If it's cooler, it will take a longer time. Um, so I always recommend to people who are starting out, just, just taste your ferment as you're going along, and then you can see how the flavor will change over time. Um, and just decide when you think it's done. And it's done when it tastes sour, you like the texture, it's got good flavor. Um, you will reach a point in your, um, in your fermentation journey that uh, you can just taste it and you know, okay, that's, that, that's done. Um, other things to consider are the methods of fermentation. So there's a couple of different methods, um, which I mentioned involving water. So we either have a dry salt method, which is what we're going to use for the sauerkraut, um, or you have a salt brine method, which is what you would use for a dill pickle. Um, and then there are other methods where um, you might have a culture added to a beverage, for example, like a sweet kvass might have some starter culture or a kombucha has a culture that's added uh, to the beverage. Um, okay, so today I've got a couple of different sauerkraut on the go here. Um, I made one just a couple hours ago. This is a red and green cabbage. Um, there's about 
uh, maybe four and a half pounds of cabbage in this. This is a two liter jar. Um, and then I've got a green cabbage with some grated carrots and some sliced red jalapenos. Uh, this is about a half a cabbage. Um, my cabbages today were about three pounds. It's like an average cabbage size, three pounds or 1,300 grams. I like to use grams because it's easier to calculate the percentage of salt. Um, uh, so one question that came up earlier was, how do you cut up a cabbage for sauerkraut? Um, it really is up to you. You could use um, a mandolin. You could use a food processor. Um, you can cut them by hand. Um, so I'm just going to cut this cabbage up so we can see. Normally here we would use a food processor. Um, but if you don't have one, uh, that's totally fine. So I just cut the stem off and I'm going to remove the outer leaves. You can save those leaves to use as waste for your, um, your kraut later. And then I just cut it in half and then cut it into quarters. And I'm just going to take this core off. So you've got your cabbage with no core. The core can be quite bitter. Um, we're going to talk about the crocito sauerkraut again. Um, one sec. Someone was asking a question about it. So you've got your quarters, you cut the core off, and then you can just slice it. So you could slice super thin, super thick, whatever you like. And then we probably should talk about flavoring. So sometimes I like just having a plain sauerkraut because you can put that with everything. Or um, you can flavor it uh, with really anything you can think of. Um, if you wanted to put garlic, you could blend a garlic, uh, a couple of garlic cloves um, into a paste with your salt and then mix it into your sauerkraut. You could add chunks of garlic. You could add um, dried spices, um, some chili flakes. You could add um, dill seed or cumin seed or um, thyme and oregano, maybe. Peppercorn, uh, juniper is a popular one. Um, you could make um, smoked paprika or cayenne pepper. Um, really, anything you can think of. Um, of the world is your oyster for sauerkraut. Um, okay, so someone mentioned um, they were wondering about the Cotito, uh sauerkraut. So um, I made this one earlier. So this is a half a cabbage. It's one carrot um, and a little bit of jalapeno. And you can see the liquid from the cabbage has come out just from the salt, just mixing it with salt. We're not pounding it or um, massaging it too much. The, the cool thing about salt is that it just draws out the, um, the moisture from the vegetables and makes a, a self brine um, just all by itself. You don't need to expend a lot of energy, although some people do like to, um, to do that and it uh, can help with if you're frustrated about something. Um, so the cookie that we make is um, carrots, onions, and cabbage, and then oregano, thyme, and chili flakes. So that's just the taste. Um, you can um, try out an amount of um, herbs and spices with your kraut, and then when it's uh, ready, just adjust. I recommend writing down um, what you're making so that the next time you make it, you can um, change your recipe to more to your liking. Um, so the um, the magical uh, percentage for um, for sauerkraut, in my opinion, is two percent. So you're going to weigh your cabbage um, and uh, calculate two percent of the weight of that cabbage. So these cabbages are 1,300 grams. 
so we want to use 26 grams of salt. If you don't have a scale, that's okay. Average cabbage plus two tablespoons of coarse salt should do the trick. Um, again, you can try that, and then if it's too salty or not salty enough, then you can change that uh, the next time you make it. Um, so I'm just going to sprinkle the salt onto the cabbage, and then I'm just going to mix it together. So if you're um, at home with your cabbage, I know uh, there are a few photos on Twitter of people who were um, who were getting their cabbages ready. So I'm literally just mixing that in, and I'm, I'm going to set it aside, and in about half an hour, there's going to be the juice from that cabbage um, coming out, and that's going to help us um, protect the ferment while it's fermenting. And that's really it. So I'm just going to see if there is any, any questions. No? Okay. So I'm going to skip ahead to the one I made earlier. Um, and I'm just going to put this, this half cabbage into a one liter mason jar. Um, so you can use really any glass container or if you have a um, pottery container. I prefer not to ferment in plastic um, because I think that the plastic absorbs the smell um, and it could potentially leak into your um, ferment. Um, but really, whatever you have um, is great. Um, so this is a two liter jar. This is what I use for my um, red and green cabbage that I made earlier. Um, this is two cabbages, roughly. So one cabbage, roughly, would fit in a one liter jar. Um, so I'm just going to grab this. You can see how much liquid is coming out of it. I don't know if you can see that, actually. Yeah, there you go. So that's all just from the cabbage. I haven't added any uh, other liquid. You want to put about half of it in and then pack it down so that you have no air. So I don't know if you can see, when you push down, you can actually see the liquid rising up and that's what you want. You want all the air holes to be filled with liquid. So then we've got a little bit of space. It's good to have space in the top because as this starts fermenting, it's going to be especially active in the first three days. Again, depending on what temperature your, um, your room is. If it's hotter, it's going to be faster. Uh, if it's below 15, it's going to be quite slow. So I'm just pushing everything down so it's all together. I'm going to tuck everything in. And then there's uh, several different things you can do at this stage. Where did I get the funnel? Um, Lee Valley. <laughs> you can get uh, amazing um, canning equipment at Lee Valley. But uh, I think also any restaurant supply store would have these. Um, so I showed you we could save um, your cabbage leaf from earlier. So you can just fold that up if you have one and tuck it in. So what we basically want to do is protect your ferment from the air. So anything in the air could cause it to mold. Um, so this is kind of like a sacrifice leaf. It may get moldy and then you just throw it up. Um, alternatively, you could use, there are um, clear glass weights you can buy that are just um, for pickling, for fermenting, little ones, um, something that's going to hold this down. Or you can get another jar that fits into the mouth of the jar and just push that down and see all the liquid in there. So whatever method you're using is absolutely fine. 
um, just make sure that it's clean. And then I would just cover this with a tea towel like I've done here. Just take the lid off of this one. So here's, you can see all of that brine right up at the top. And I just put a little mason jar in the mouth of this jar so that there is no um, extra space at the top. And then I'm just covering the whole thing so that um, no fruit flies and dust um, come inside. I recommend labeling it with a name and the date so that you can remember what you made and when you made it. Um, so I think we could probably open up to questions if anyone has any. I have one. So okay. when you salted the cabbage, how, so you left that one that you just put in the jar, you left it for like two hours? Um, yeah, maybe an hour and a half. Yeah. So do you, do you use time or do you say, okay, it's got a certain amount of liquid in it already? Um, what I um, like to tell folks in a, whenever we do workshops in person is like you can see this one, which I just did, is already getting, um, you can get, see it getting shiny. Mm -hmm. um, just from like a few minutes. So that's the salt starting to work on the cabbage. Um, once, once you can see moisture or water in the bottom of the bowl, or if you squeeze it and you can see it dripping out, then you're good. But you will see the texture of the cabbage kind of transform over that half an hour to an hour. Um, it will actually get softer, it will change color. Um, that's what you're looking for because in this stage, if you pack it in to the jar, there's no moisture. Um, there's not enough moisture to fill in all those little gaps. And you really don't want to have any air inside your jar because you're trying to protect it from the sauce. Right. So you need to have some moisture so that you can fill that up. I get that. That's really cool. Yeah. Also, you yeah. kind of blew my mind, Rebecca, because I never knew that Bix pickles weren't fermented. <laughs> I just <laughs> <laughs> but they're just vinegar. You're right. Yeah. So yeah. The same. Well, interesting. <laughs> oh, and Amy's back. Great. So oh. we, have, uh, we have a few questions. Um, question. Yes. Where do the organisms that do the fermentation come from the cabbage? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Can you, can you see the little bloom on that cabbage? Everything that we need is right here. Um, nature is pretty amazing. Um, and if it's not on here, it's in the air. So um, the salt is really just, its job is to protect that this organism or this mixture from um, the bad bacteria. I mean, this is my regular person's description. I'm sure there's a more science description, um, but you know, that's all you really need is the cabbage and the salt. You don't need other starter cultures. You don't need anything fancy. Um, that's it. It's incredible, really, that, that that's floating around. And there, there was an interesting paper done, interesting paper done where they actually cultured the organisms on people who were sourdough bakers' hands and the influence of the human uh, microflora influencing the fermentation products that they were working on. And so I bet Rebecca has amazing microflora <laughs> just from all the work that she's doing with uh, different different organisms. But yeah, very so cool. So how is it that, you know, we're all being told, wash your hands 8,000 times a day because we don't want the things on our hands anywhere near us. So how is it that those things are good when they're in sauerkraut? How come they don't kill us? Inevitably, there's been a lot of work in germ theory, and there are so many different pathogens within the environment. But at the same time, soap and water is sufficient. We really don't need to be using antibiotic-based soaps for sanitizing. Obviously, I, I, I should preface that with COVID. We should be using good hygiene right now. But going out and we don't, ha we don't necessarily have to... Uh, hyper sanitize everything that we are eating before we're uh, before we're consuming it and you know i at this fermentation festival i went to somebody asked that and 
so, uh, it was Sandor Katz actually said, the fermentation guru said, uh, no one ever dies from eating homemade pickles. And that's a true fact. I always assume someone's going to die from eating home, but they don't. So Now, let me do preface that. Uh, the 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 wonderful thing about pickling and fermenting is that you get on a you get on a bit of a, a tangent and you get excited about your capabilities. I do highly recommend that people take a look at some validated protocols. Um, I often get questions about home canning and people will start canning things like beets or corn or green beans and the potential for botulism is is there. Uh, canned foods need to be below pH four point six to be uh, safely heat preserved without using um, high pressure um, canning processes. And so you have to have the, uh, the equilibrated pH of that product below pH 4.6. Any acid level above that um, into the mid uh, five and above can support the growth of botulism and botulism can kill you. And so, Yes, you uh, pickles. Pickles are likely likely going to be safe because again, you've got so much organic acid being produced in that fermentation. But be always cautious and always reach out to the scientific community. Reach out to good scientific uh, validated resources before starting to can all sorts of random things. Right, but the the idea is to get that sauerkraut down to a pH of three, right? So that would absolutely, be absolutely okay. So uh, Rebecca's just going to get her other headphones because she's having some trouble hearing. And I wanted to ask her, I, I, we have a question. Do you have to use pickling salt for this? I don't think you do. No, I I, so I, I, I'll jump in on that one. Um, different salts have different, um, different other chemicals within it. And so some table salt contains iodine and that's for nutrition purposes to prevent goiter. And iodine is an inhibitory factor for the growth of many organisms. Other table salts may also include anti-caking agents, and those just add cloudiness to your pickling. So um, finding a non-iodized salt is ideal for the situation. And I think Rebecca said she was using sea salt, so that would be perfect. I don't know if you Absolutely. can hear it. I can see your shoulder, Rebecca, but I can't. I don't know if you can hear it. I don't think so. Okay. Oh, great. So Rebecca, good. here's a question for you. Is there a tool for measuring the pH? Oh, in can products. So, so that somebody's learning how to, how to can. Is there a tool you can measure pH? Oh, for canning. Totally yeah. different. I know. Totally um, different. But, oh, but I a can pH jump. meter would do it. Yeah. So you can buy a pH meter on yeah. Amazon, I think. So. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. pH meters... Um, I highly recommend that you get a calibrating solution to go along with it. But pH meters, the price of them is now in the tens. Uh, you can get them for like $30, $40. Or you can also get uh, litmus paper. Do make sure that you're getting litmus paper that's for the right pH range. And so you want to be discreetly around that pH 4.6 and always below pH 4.6 before hot water bath uh, canning. So the question when you were getting your headphones, Rebecca, was about pickling salt. And I said, I think you were using sea salt. Is that correct? Is there any? Yes. Yeah. Pickling? You have to buy the special pickling salt. Any kind of salt is fine as long as it doesn't have anything added to it. So table salt has iodine. You don't want that. It's inhibiting the bacteria that we're trying to, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> to encourage. Yeah. Great. Good. Uh, we had questions before in the chat, and I wrote them down. Uh, and this is uh, this is interesting. So what? So this is kind of confusing us, right? We're talking about canning. We're talking about vinegar. We're talking about all these different. So we're obviously confused about what steps or products need to be present for something to be considered fermented. Amy, you want to take that? Sorry, my I just did have someone walk in on me. Oh, who just, sorry. Um, but um, so what technically is fermented? Again, it, the definition of fermentation is all over the map depending on what science you come from. Um, but in general, it implies that there's been some sort of ethanolic or lactic acid uh, fermentation that's occurred. Um, remind me of the question again, pardon me. Oh, yeah, again, so what, I guess that's it. It's like, what's the thing that makes something fermented versus something that's just preserved and or whatever? 
And so fermentation would just imply that there's been some sort of organism and some sort of biochemical conversion of the component that could be spoiled and converted into something that is going to reduce the spoilage on it. Right. So that canning is not that. Canning, we try to get rid of all the things, right? But so in, in canning, we're using time and temperature processes to extend the shelf life. And we're also using an anaerobic environment. So the seal on that can is reducing um, the oxygen available to the food. And that's going to prevent both um, oxidation reactions from occurring in the food, as well as the potential for aerobic organisms to grow out in it. Yeah, so this whole, that kind of preserving is super different than fermentation. Fermentation is a, it's a very organic kind. Of, I always think it was like a little biodiversity thing, experiment going on. And, and that, that's what makes it so interesting, I think. And, and how it's different every time, right? You, it depends on which organisms you have in there as yeah. to what you get out at the end. So how long after you um, get your sauerkraut, Rebecca, in, in your jar, do you put it, you leave it out, and then do you put it in the refrigerator, or what do you do with it? Yeah, so um, again, depending on the temperature, so we're right now we're looking at about two weeks for fermenting a sauerkraut that's harvested, uh, cabbage that's harvested recently. Um, that's at about 20 degrees. Um, but it's really done when you say it's done. So um, you could leave it to get super funky, uh, until December, if you want, um, as long as you're checking on it to make sure there's no um, mold or, or particles that have fallen into it. Um, but as soon as you think that it's done, you like the texture, you like the flavor, then you're going to take your um, weights out and put a lid on and then put it in the fridge. And then so it can, can stay in the fridge um, mm -hmm. for quite a long time, again, depending on your preference. Um, I think because we have an abundance of ferments at our disposal here, I really like to eat fresher ferments. I'm not that interested in the archive of, you know, five-year-old sauerkraut um, because we're, you know, we're a little spoiled for selection here. But um, some people really like the really interesting, very funky, unusual, um, older ferments. So that won't kill you. Yeah, uh, it should be fine. Yeah. yeah. So you can actually, I mean, the, the one question is, what happens if we use a tightly sealed lid while fermenting? I think that's probably not a good idea. Uh. <laughs> not, a good, not a good idea. Exactly. Yeah, your, your friend, the, the carbon dioxide is going to um, make itself very known. Um, even, even without, um, you know, a firmly closed lid, even with something just like this, you're gonna see it bubbling. This is gonna rise up um, more. Um, you know, there'll be pockets of air because that CO2 is pushing everything up. So then after a couple of days, you wanna maybe like push it back down again, get the air out, um, let those gases escape. Um, and then it'll kind of settle down as it's like done its thing. Um, you can really see that transformation um, over the time of its fermenting. Um, activity so it's okay to open it up and test it along the way like if, yep. if you have a canning mindset you're like well you don't open it up right i mean that's right. the whole thing right so i yeah. think we have to get at that out of our mind and say oh we can open it up and test it see if we like it yeah then, this ah. is like a, a relationship you're you're cultivating a good environment for this to um help you make something that um that you want so you're 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 testing it. Same with a sourdough. I mean, a lot of people have pretty strong relationships with their sourdough starters um, now. There's there's Amy's right there. Yeah. Oh, so mine. Phoenix, I love yeah. mine. Um, so the the question there's a couple questions here, and they're both the same. So you didn't wash your cabbage before you put it in there. Right. And the question is: Is cleanliness the enemy of fermentation? It sounds like it is. It de you know it depends. We need to be. Um, we need to be reasonable with um, with cleanliness. You're going to have a clean kitchen. You're going to wash your hands. You're not going to roll your cabbage on the ground, uh, you know, in a public place before you use it. Um, so I would give it a rinse if that happened. Um, but that's why you're taking the outer leaves off. Cabbage is very hardly packed. It's very contained. There's no dirt that's inside the cabbage. 
um, so we don't need to worry about that. Maybe if you're lucky, you'll get a, a worm or something, um, but you're gonna just keep your eyes open for those kinds of things. Um, but yeah, you wanna set your, um, your ferment up for success. So you're not going to have particles or dirt or, um, you know, you're gonna have things clean before you start so that it can do its thing. But that said, it is a pretty robust um, uh, situation and it probably could combat, you know, the odd thing here and there. So once you, there's a question that, once you've got the taste profile that you want, how do you stop the fermentation? Do you just put it in the it? fridge? Eat it, oh, yeah, it. just eat it, <laughs> yeah. Um, but and putting it in the fridge slows down that process. So we're not stopping it completely. Like if you wanted to stop it, you would pasteurize it or cook it. Um, but uh, putting it in the fridge slows it down enough so that you have time to consume it over a period of time. So um, somebody's asked any jar materials you don't want to use. And I think you mentioned don't use plastic. I, yeah, I prefer not to use anything plastic. Yeah. And I see I see one of my students is jumping in and answering in the chat box. Hey, Jimmy. Um, <laughs> honestly, um, glass is ideal uh, at the household level. In industrial settings, it's challenging because in larger food processing facilities, they can't use they can't use glass because of the food safety um, requirements. Um, and so plastic is common, but it has to be food grade plastic specifically. One challenge is if you're using metal at the household level, many times the organic acids start to corrode metal. And so metal lids in uh, mason jars or Bernardin type jars can start to corrode over time if you, if you store it in the, in the fridge. So you do want to avoid using metal. And again, I would at the household level focus on using glass. We, we actually slightly different. We ferment in stainless steel here, so we use what we use wine fermenters for our um, our fermentation um, tanks. Does stainless it stainless is going to be passivized so that it it does not react with the organic acids. But right. at the household level, many of the uh, cheap metal um, bowls and cans that people get at uh, Canadian Tire or the dollar yeah. store can start to corrode over time. Yeah. So should you put your jars in the dishwasher or like? super hot water or like, I, again, I'm thinking canning. I know that's different, but. I yeah, you don't need them. to boil them for 10 minutes. Um, again, I hesitate about dishwashers because some of them don't um, sanitize at a super high temperature. Mm -hmm. um, we have a sanitizer here, so um, that's perfect. Um, but what I suggest for home use is just um, giving it a really good wash, hot soapy water, very well rinsed, and then pour boiling water um, over the jars and then you've, you know, just let it sit for a, a minute or two. That's good. Yeah. Um, I think we can all do that. Uh, there are uh, some questions about probiotic um, values in fermented foods, like let's say sauerkraut. So one is, do the new and the old ferments have the same probiotic values? I don't know. So <laughs> what's, what's really interesting is that the organisms change over time. And you will have senescence of those organisms and you will have a changing of the flora over time. Now, Health Canada's stance is that it's really hard for food companies to go and make uh, a strong claim against what, a, uh, what probiotic health benefits can be made on a food product. So in general, when, when we go out and advise small companies who are doing fermentations, we say, you know what, it's really implied through a lot of the a, a lot of the um, presence that you have and through the through the side communications that you have with the general public. But Health Canada really doesn't allow for specific marketing claims to be made against probiotics. Um, that said, at the household level, I totally encourage people to be consuming them because again, increasing the diversity of your gut microflora has so many potential net health benefits. So does the probiotic value change over time? Yes, it does. Um, if you are an industrial processor, you have, if you are making a probiotic claim, you have to be able to prove that at the end of your shelf life of your product, the probiotic value that you're, or the, the, the number of organisms that you're claiming is the same and they have to be viable organisms. Mm. That's the other piece of the puzzle. The bacteria can go into a non-vegetative state 
and they can go into spore uh, spore form and um, whether they get activated or not in your gut is something that's still being investigated by science. Well, this is related question came up. Do stomach acid medications affect probiotics in fermented food? Yeah, absolutely. So this is interesting and not directly in the food, but in the ability of your gut to assimilate the organisms. And how do we know this? Uh, in the case of infants, infants and their, um, the, the acidity of their gastrointestinal tract is much less than it is in adults. And it's at that infancy stage that much of the microflora is formed in our guts. So indeed, we know that the acidity and the level of gastric acid that we're producing has a has a really strong impact on microflora within our guts. So I would I would assume there is. I'm not I'm not a medical doctor. I my my background's in food science, but we know from nutrition that that's how it should be. Yeah, interesting. So we have botulism is a big question here. So everybody's concerned about preventing botulism and how do you know if your fermentation jar has been infected with it? It so, won't be. <laughs> it won't be because if you have a really good vigorous start on that fermentation, and Rebecca was really awesome to show some different hints to show that fermentation is occurring, that you're seeing bubbling occurring, that you you are getting uh, a good acidic um, nose off of that product. Botulism does not like acid. And really most uh, pH 4.6, which is that magic, uh, as we call it, a critical limit for the growth of botulism, it's, it's not overly acidic. Most fermented fruits and vegetables get into the low, um, low four into the three range and even lower sometimes on older ferments. So we're okay. We don't have to worry about botulism. And botulism and also is a, it, it, Really, your your concern about botulism is mostly for canned vegetables, where you're going straight to chopping, putting in a jar, and thermally processing it. A low acid. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I think we're okay. We should all go out, cut our cabbages, salt them, see what happens. And I think we need to let you two two ladies, you know, do that. And so send us send us your photos. Yes. Here, uh, you can meet my my. This is my uh, my kimchi. <laughs> uh, does it have a name? No, he was only made a week ago. I, my favorite, my favorite. I have a teenager, and she loves macaroni and cheese. And I always have macaroni and kimchi. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I always think we should name all these fermented products because they are on the basis of living organisms. So I would <laughs> give them a name. So I think my sourdough is named George. <laughs> Mine is Phoenix. What's yours, Rebecca? You must have a sourdough. I don't actually have a sourdough right now. Oh. We, ha we have a lot of things to take care of in <laughs> yeah. here. So um, I think we have, yeah, I think we have plenty at the moment. But when I did have one, its name was Aldo. Sweet. It's it, really, it is like taking care. It is like having a whole bunch of weird pets that you have to make sure they're happy and fed. Yeah, yeah it's great. Well, thank you both so much. This is really awesome. I, I think it was a terrific um, demo and a terrific, we learned a ton, Amy, and I just want to thank you both for taking the time to do it. And yay, good for you. Thanks so much. Thank you. And we hope that everybody watching, I, we hope that you enjoyed the presentation and the demo as well. And as Rebecca said, we want to see your progress. We want to see your creations. I'm going to do mine right as soon as I get, get off this. I'm going to go chop my cabbage just waiting here for me and make my sauerkraut. So you can tag us at, at RCI Science uh, in your photos on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, and please share your feedback with us. Let us know what you'd like to see from us in the future. I think there will be a link in the chat box about that on how to um, get in touch with us. And do join us on, oh my God, next Sunday is October 4th. I can't believe next Sunday is already October 4th. And another timely discussion, we're exploring the science of wildfires in a special panel moderated by a former Fleming Award win winner, Edward Struzik. And so we're going to talk about how wildfire works, how we can live with wildfires, because we obviously are living with wildfires. Um, but if you like science of food and drink, as I do very much, uh, we are going to have on October 16th, 
the science of baking. We're going to look at the great, we're going to have the great pandemic bake off. Um, so uh, if you watch the great Canadian baking show, season two runner up, Sasha and Seth will be walking us through the science of baking and showing us how to make his gingerbread cake with whipped cream. Could it be better? And your sauerkraut will be ready by then so you can enjoy both of those at that time. You can get um, details on all of our upcoming events at our website, so rciscience.ca slash what's on, and that should be in the chat box. There it is. And I just want to thank all of you for spending your evening with us and learning about sauerkraut and stay safe and keep on fermenting. See you next time. Bye. <laughs>